Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Isn't that a great statement? Paul wrote that to the Colossians, and, and it's filled with um, instruction about music. Maybe you hadn't thought of it, but when you sing or when you play your instruments or when you participate in any part of a music ministry, you teach and admonish one another. Interestingly, we don't sing in other settings, but when we come to the church where we worship, 
Singing is not only appropriate, it's expected. So we do so with great delight. Thank you for joining your voices as Don leads us. Today you're in for a real musical treat as we enjoy the music of our choir and our orchestra and special, special songs that have been designed to turn our attention vertically. If you're visiting with us online, we're happy to have you as our guests today viewing the service. And if you're here as a guest, we're pleased to have you as a visitor. Uh, we would uh, love to have you back. And you're always welcome if you're able to return. So please know that to be true. Uh, we look for ways to sort of summarize the events of our ministry. And it's impossible to include them all, but we focus on a few by putting them on the screen. We call this our Stonebriar Minute. So we have to listen closely and quickly to these words as they describe what's ahead. Listen to something about the season of the year. I think you'll find it not only interesting, but helpful. Hey, Stonebriar family. I'm Susan Zeeby from Missional Living. It's collection week for Thanks for Giving and Operation Christmas Child, so here's how you can get involved. In case you haven't heard, our church is collecting food for local families in need and gifts for kids around the world, all for the purpose of encouraging people with the love of Jesus. If you'd like to help, come see us in the atrium today or go online to find out what to donate. Then, bring your donations to our festive season of giving drive through this Monday through Friday, November 7th through the 11th. Our team will be outside Building A from 4 to 7 p.m. each day to collect your items, so you don't even have to get out of your car. But if you do want to help in a hands-on way, you can come and pack Thanksgiving bags with us on Saturday, November the 12th. Find all of the details at stonebriar.org slash season of giving. And speaking of the holiday season, we're heading into the most wonderful time of the year, and you're invited to come celebrate the birth of Jesus with us. We have our annual Christmas concerts coming up in December, along with special events like our women's brunch, plus more ways to share God's love as we continue our season of giving and we'll even have a Christmas devotional guide you can enjoy at home. So as you make your plans for the Christmas season, check out all the ways that you can celebrate with our church family at stonebriar.org slash Christmas. Thank you for being here this morning. Gonna have a wonderful service of worship. Let me give you a roadmap about how the songs are put together and where we're heading this morning. Our first hymn, the first two words, present the theme of the morning. We're going to sing, praise him. <laughs> praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Our second hymn announces that we acknowledge that he is worthy of our worship. Following that, as a congregation, we will speak words from First Chronicles 29. And after that, I'll ask you to be seated, but we want you to participate in the anthem this morning. Anthem is very unique. It, it's a series of questions. And uh, we will answer the questions. For instance, the first question is, do you feel the world is broken? And our response is, we do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. So whenever you look up on the screen and you see uh, words in brackets, uh, that will be our response to, to, to those questions. And following the anthem, I'll ask you to sing once again, and we'll conclude uh, the worship by singing the, the majesty and glory of your name. But first, unstrap your seatbelt, stand up, and let's sing vigorously. <clears throat> Here we go.
Let's speak scripture together, reminding ourselves that this is the word of the Lord. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. We give you thanks and praise your glorious name. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give you strength to all. Now,
hearts this morning to express our hearts to you, to honor and affirm we believe that you're great and that you are worthy of our praise. Everything that comes out of our mouths and stringed instruments and everything that is in our hearts that wants to yearn for you and cry out to you, we do so this morning. Thank you for loving us first and best and most deeply. In your name we pray, amen. In our journey through the minor prophets, we have come to the fourth of the 12, the least known and the smallest, in every way the most obscure, the book of Obadiah. Please uh, locate that just before the book of Jonah in your Bibles, single chapter, only 21 verses. I'll read a few from this chapter. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Once you find your place, please stand with me out of respect for the Word of God. This is the vision that the sovereign Lord revealed to Obadiah concerning the land of Edom. We have heard a message from the Lord that an ambassador was sent to the nations to say, get ready everyone, let's assemble our armies and attack Edom. The Lord says to Edom, I will cut you down to size among the nations. You will be greatly despised. You have been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and make your home high in the mountains. Who can ever reach us way up here, you ask boastfully. But even if you soar as high as eagles and build your nest among the stars, I will bring you crashing down, says the Lord. Please bow with me in prayer. All the inhabitants of the earth are as nothing, and you do according to your will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can say to you, 
What are you doing? We live in a day of great arrogance and pride. And we realize as we read this fragment of scripture that you despise both. You even hate a proud look. We're entering into a week where we will see many of those proud looks and hear many arrogant voices. We as a nation have lost our way. We have long since walked in our own way and not in your way. We have forgotten what you have promised if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven forgive their sins, and heal their land. Our land needs healing, and we cannot heal ourselves. Our Father, rather than looking past the evil of our ways, penetrate through it, reveal it clearly, use these few words from this small book to arrest our attention and make us aware anew that you have ways of cutting people down to size, especially those who walk in pride and arrogance. Today, I pray that you will connect with each one of us, saying something very special to one person and something altogether different to someone else, depending on the need. Speak to fathers of families and mothers as well. Speak to single parents. Speak to the singles. Speak to young people and older alike. Remind us, our Father, that you are sovereign. You are God and we are not. We are dependent upon you. And just as you address these things in an ancient city, in an ancient time, bridge the days between then and now and show us the relevance of what we will discover in these few words in this small, obscure book. Help us to take it personally and not soon forget it. We bow before you, we humble ourselves before you, and for a change, we listen to you. So speak, Lord. We will hear, we will apply the truth, and by your grace, we will change. Use the gifts that are given to your work to serve the right purposes. May these funds be handled in integrity and used only for your glory. I pray through Christ our Lord. All the people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated.
The book of Obadiah is a study in obscurity. We really know nothing about the man himself. He's virtually an unknown. He's almost like a meteor across the night sky. There's a flash, he appears, and he's gone, never to be mentioned again. We know nothing of his relatives. Even his mother and father are never mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Furthermore, I've never known anyone who's chosen a verse of scripture from Obadiah as their favorite verse in the Bible. In fact, most have never read the book, though it is the shortest book in all the Old Testament, only 21 verses. It's almost like a fragment of Hebrew scripture that's been included just before the well-known book of Jonah. But here it sits, waiting to be discovered and understood. Uh, I suppose we could say it is the most minor of all the minor prophets if we go by size. And if the best gifts come in the smallest packages, there has to be a powerful message somewhere in these 21 verses. And there is. Because I don't want you to miss the message as we get involved in the study of the book, I want to give it to you on the front end. If you walk in pride and arrogance, God will cut you down to size. I do not care what your status, your position, your portfolio, I do not care what your reputation may be, your celebrity, or lack of such. You walk in pride, you walk in arrogance, he will cut you down to size. Few things God hates more than pride and arrogance. And we are shot through with it as a country. We know little of humility, especially among our well-known leaders. We are about to enter a week where we will witness all kinds of of proud statements and boasting. Statements will be made that sound very much like the truth and they will be bold face lies. Not all, but many of the politicians are masters or mistresses at lying. The only way we know they lie is their lips are moving. Sounds are coming out of their throat. We've gotten to where we are used to it, unfortunately, rather than calling them on the carpet. God hates pride. He despises arrogance. And if there's a message your children and mine and your grandchildren and mine need to learn, it's that one. Because they will be exposed to it all their lives. Now Obadiah, this strange little book, until you learn about the backstory that gives its meaning. It's the story of a venomous feud that's been going on for centuries. The feud of all things began in the birth canal of a mother who is about to release to this world a set of twin boys. The older on his way out of the womb and out of the canal is being gripped by his younger brother at the heel. And they're even fighting 
on the way to birth. You wonder how often his, their mothers, their mother must have said to the boys, would you please settle down and stop fighting? Of course, they ignored her all their lives. Up, oh, I should say, when it came to fighting, they ignored her, but they did settle down. The older settled down in, in the land of uh, Edom, the younger in the land of Israel. So you know by now I'm referring to Esau and Jacob. They hated each other. They fought against each other. We can pinpoint Israel, and most people can, rather quickly when they see a map of the Holy Land, there it is. Or even of the Middle East, there's Israel. Most would be hard pressed to locate Edom. So allow me, down south of the Dead Sea, about 100 miles along and about 50 miles wide was the ancient region of Edom. Jacob settled in Israel, Esau settled in Edom. Many visit Israel without ever realizing just a little bit further and they could visit what was once known as Edom. The best known city in Edom, of course, is Petra now located in the land of Jordan, which is east of Israel. When you go to Jordan, you travel a long ways south. You come down to Petra. And there you walk into one of the seven wonders of the world. Amazing. Amazing it is. It is a world of solid rock. The rock face stands 700 feet, seven stories high. And the rocks are of deep, deep purple mixed with pink. Etched into the rocks are beautiful, beautiful structures. The, you'll feel like your infant size when you walk through that valley, once called a ravine. As you walk along that mile-long ravine, you look up, and even if you stop at one of the carved doorways, you feel tiny in size. The doorway itself towers over you. The people of Petra dwelt in this high, high dwelling, which gave them great position in times of war. As any veteran will tell you, there's nothing quite like elevation to give you the upper hand in battle as you look down on the enemy. No one could conquer Petra, or so they thought, given their height. So they lived in the pride and arrogance of their height in their rock fortress, towering high above the surface of the earth. When you go there, your guide will, if he knows the scriptures, will open the book of Obadiah, and you'll be surprised to read what it says about dwelling in these high places, even if you have your nest as high as an eagle, the Lord is even greater and higher, and he will bring you down. Living in these well-watered plains were the people of Petra, proud, arrogant people because they never knew defeat in battle. 
Furthermore, they had the opportunity to strike back at Israel every chance they got. They wouldn't even allow Moses to bring the people of the Hebrews as he was on his journey from Exodus to Canaan. They wouldn't allow him to bring the people through the ravine area, go around us. They stood back and watched with their arms folded as Israel went through struggles, never once attempting to help them survive or to endure the attacks. The people of Petra dripping with pride. We see similar situations, by the way, when we in the sports world watch boxers that never lose a fight. You've never seen one of them that's humble. They're all arrogant and proud. The same is true of football teams that go through the entire season and never lose a game. They and their coaches walk in pride over their record. The tennis player who never loses a match is known for his arrogance even yelling back at the referee on occasion. And even attorneys who don't lose a, a case are quick to tell potential clients, when you use our firm, you use one that's never known defeat. There's arrogance in that. There's pride, easily pride in that. When your child makes straight A's, watch for it. Watch for it. It's easy for that child to begin to believe that he's something special, even though his intelligence is a gift from God. Even though your daughter may be musically inclined and be able to play difficult pieces on an instrument, watch it. Watch out for arrogance. It comes with success. So it's important that we learn early to walk in humility. And we will not learn it from our culture. You don't learn humility in the street. So the Lord sent a prophet. Isn't it interesting? He sent an obscure, not a prince of the prophets, and apparently not one all that, all that well-known in that day. If he was well-educated, we're never told. If he was famous in some circles, we're never told. He's obscure. And the Lord chooses him to bring the message. And what a message it was. The Lord says to Edom, verse 2, I will cut you down to size among the nations. You will be greatly despised. In fact, you have been deceived by your own pride because you live in a rock fortress and you make your home high in the mountains. You can... You, you, you can... You can, none can even reach up here where we dwell. And you say that boastfully, who could ever reach and defeat us? But even if you soar as high as eagles and build your nest among the stars, I will bring you crashing down, says the Lord. Remember this. Remember words like that. If you happen to be in a particular company that's on the rise and, and, and God has blessed you and, and uh, the, the uh, uh, success is obvious to your competitors, uh, be careful. I warn you. And on top of all of this, the people of Petra were eaten up with revenge and hatred. 
When that is true, all kinds of things can happen. You are unaware of your bitterness and you are numbed, numbed by your revenge. A great place to pause and ask, do you hold grudges? You have a list. Are there names that surface that you immediately wipe off or wipe out? The Edomites fail to learn the lesson that there is one greater than any of them. And that is the Lord himself. So that he sent Edom, he sent Obadiah to Edom to remind them. Told him of those allies that were once their friends who would chase them from their land. They will deceive you. They will promise you peace when in fact they'll be plotting to deceive and destroy you. These are your trusted friends who will be setting traps for you. What serious warnings. You should not have gloated when they exiled your relatives, meaning Israel, to distant lands. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered misfortune. You should not have spoken arrogantly when the terrible times of trouble shook them. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have. You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads killing those who tried to escape. You should not have captured the survivors and handed them over in their terrible time of trouble in the feud, stop it. Even though they may say, well, the other side is having a feud with us, that's not acceptable. Obadiah sits as a small book with a major message to all of us. Especially if you are given to your success. I was reading recently in uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon book, Lectures to My Students. It's a beautiful book to those he was mentoring there in the city of London. He writes this in a very unique vulnerable moment, a quote, success can go to my head and it will unless I remember that it is God who accomplishes the work that he can continue to do so without my help and that he will be able to make out with other means whenever he cuts me down to size. I believe Spurgeon pulled that statement straight out of Obadiah. Where else do you find the lions when he cuts me down to size? Don't answer out loud, but can you remember the last time you were cut down to size? It's a humbling experience. I remember during my senior year in high school, I was a I was a part of the band and we were all excited about that senior year because we had on our football team, the star of the city. Donald Carpenter was the runner in our backfield and he had been great in our junior year, but by the senior year, so much of the press in Houston was revolving around this young man who could just find the smallest hole in the line and shoot through and find his way to the goal line. And we began to believe our own stuff. In fact, as a, one of the band leaders, I, 
I suggested we develop a march that was kind of a strut. <laughs> you know, we were marching rather firmly and directly and like military. I said, we could develop a strut. After all, we've got Donald Carpenter as our star. Well, the coach believed it too, so he built the entire, entire team around this young man, this outstanding runner. The problem is the second play of the game and the first game of the season, compound fracture broke his leg, and we wound up with a season of zero and 10. By the way, we never developed a strut in the band that I had talked about. We had been cut down to size. If you travel in Australia, they will tell you that they're known for cutting down the tall puppy. They have no place for arrogance. After all, they began as a penal colony, so they have no pride there. That is the sense of arrogance, and they have no place for your arrogance either. We've made room for it. We even encourage it. If we're not careful, we develop it. I love the words of Jim Elliott, the missionary, who says in his journal, the saint who advances on his knees never retreats. We're not good people about falling to our knees. We talk about standing tall and chest out and often looking down on others. How wrong that is. Oh, I, I, I love this country. I serve in the military, in defense of this country. I believe in this country, but I'm disturbed by the arrogance I see in it. And it can seep into a church. One of the difficulties of going to pastor conferences, most of you don't go because you're not pastors, but when you do go, you have to put up with all of the bragamonies about whose church is getting larger and how many new members came in and how many were baptized this year. And, you know, I, I found myself wanting to stand up and go, who cares? I've not done that yet, but I've thought about it. <laughs> Where does size ever emerge in scripture as the mark of blessing? I mean, Junior on Hee Haw was right. He said, if size meant anything, a cow could outrun a rabbit. <laughs> Don't brag about size. Don't brag about grades. Don't brag. Teach your child not to brag. I have friends who are in our church and their family, one of some of their family members lived in Fort Myers. Sound familiar? Maybe it didn't until several weeks ago when the storm hit at a velocity of 150 miles an hour and wiped out the beautiful beaches tore up the homes, destroyed neighborhoods, flooded areas, calamity to buildings all around. This particular family's family, extended family, had been in Miami to stay away from the, the storm. And when they made their way back, they discovered that their home was one of the few that wasn't destroyed wasn't even flooded. You know what they did? They went out and purchased everything they could find that would help their neighbors rebuild. Isn't that a beautiful response? They bought chainsaws and 
and uh, equipment that would help neighborhoods uh, clear out the debris and, and get order back in their lives, rather than any sense of arrogance that their home was, was one that was hardly touched by the storm. Tornadoes can do that, wiping out a whole area, and yours is protected. That's the time to come to the rescue of your broken friends in their need. You do that when you're humble, when you're compassionate, when you realize that whatever you have is by the grace of God. When you are not arrogant. Verses 1 to 9 in, in Obadiah tell of the divine judgment that is announced by the prophet. Verses 10 to 14 give us the reasons for Edom's punishment when they are cut down to size. These are the reasons. And then 15 to 21, Edom is destroyed and of all things, Israel is restored it's a beautiful picture of the ultimate restoration of Israel, not Edom, but Israel. I find uh, five, six, seven lessons from this little obscure book that you would otherwise move past to get on to the other prophets. Let's pause here and listen to some of these lessons together. And believe me, I've worked over them carefully and I've reviewed them again and again. They speak volumes to me personally. Number one, God's wheels of judgment grind slowly but exceedingly fine. All God's accounts are not settled at the end of the day or on the first and 15th of the month. His wheels grind slowly, slower than your timepiece. He's ever at work watching, observing, seeing those who walk in humility. I mentioned earlier the problem with leaders and the arrogance of such. I've uh, lived long enough to really come to realize that our greatest president ever was one who would probably never get on the ticket today. 16th president, second great education, born in abject poverty lost his mother while a little boy, helped build the coffin in which her body was placed as he and his father buried his mother. Abraham Lincoln, who by the grace of God and the sovereign hand of God, got on the ticket and was of all things elected by the people. What a study in humility. Reminding the people periodically that we walk in humility, even in victory. His generals asked him what they were going to, what we were going to do, the Union forces, once the war was finished, and they've got these numerous Confederate soldiers. They expected some kind of retaliation because of their hatred for the enemy. And Lincoln's response was, in so many words, we will set them free. Where possible, we'll send them on their way with a horse so they can plow their fields and begin to live again. How kind. What a humble response. The second lesson I learned from Obadiah 
Human defenses are useless when the power of God comes against them. As tall and as strong rock as those fortresses were in Petra, it all came crumbling down. All the inhabitants of the earth are as nothing. God does his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can shake his fist and say, what are you doing? No one can hold him back. Teach your children that. Teach them to walk in humility. Teach them to rely on one who has given them breath in their lungs and their ability to think and to grow and to learn. Teach them to give thanks. You still pray at your meals, don't you? That's still a vital part of your family tradition, isn't it? You don't wait till Thanksgiving, do you? Every meal is a gift where you have more on your table than most in this country ever see. I remember when we were in seminary and we invited the, the Korean men over. At that time, the only other nationality at the seminary campus were the Koreans, and there were 17 of them. Our little apartment, we had little folding tables we opened up and went in with another family and, and we put the meal on the, on the tables. We had a couple of turkeys and we had all the trimmings and wives had come together to prepare the meal and we invited the men over. And they were there without their wives, by the way. They left their wives in Korea. By the way, many of them didn't go home for four years as they got their education. And, and, and they walked in, uh, shirt and tie, they were all dressed up. And uh, we happily welcomed them and they stood and stared. They'd never seen so much food on table in their lives. One man said we could feed one family for eight months with just the food on this table. I said to the older of the group, I said, would you, uh, would, would you, before you sing your national anthem, would you lead us in prayer and, and please pray in your own tongue? So I'm telling you, when you ask a Korean to pray, you better sit down <laughs> uh, because he, he's going to go from Alaska to Zurich as, as he, as he covers the the needs and, and he poured out his heart and then they all stood ramrod straight as they sang their national anthem and there wasn't a dry eye in the room and i thought every thanksgiving we eat like this these dear men thanked us till the day they graduated for that that day we had included them in our invitation. Let's be grateful people. Let's be thankful for our health. Let's not forget the blessings that are ours, the protection we have, the freedom we enjoy. The third lesson I learn is an arrogant spirit leads to a fall just as pride precedes destruction. And the fourth, all who rejoice in others' calamity and gloat over their misfortune will suffer serious consequences. It would be great to recover a compassion among our people of America where we really do reach out. I love that about our church. Every time we present needs, you respond magnificently. And many in our country do. 
make sure that your family carries that with them as a part of their training when they leave the nest of your home. Number five, those who are blinded, those who hold a grudge are blinded by bitterness and numbed by hatred. I hope by the end of this message, you've decided to drop your grudges. I hope you've learned to reach out with a genuine handshake and release all of this resistance to certain people who may have offended you or hurt your feelings in some way. I tell them at the seminary when I speak there, especially those going into the pastorate, learn to look past offenses. Look past them or you will never last very long in the ministry. Number six, it's impossible to walk humbly with God while feeling superior to anyone. You and I are not better than anyone. We're just sinners saved by grace. Seventh and finally, to continue a feud is complicated and exhausting. To end one is simple and relieving. The secret is forgiveness. Is there someone you need to forgive? Stop and think. There's someone you need to forgive. You know the one thing we all have in common? We've been hurt by someone else. Every person in this room has someone who did them wrong. Forgive them. The alternative is that you are reduced to your own judgmental spirit. My plea today is that you leave this place with a heart of forgiveness. Whatever it takes. You know what's so great about the cross? It represents that. Remember Jesus' words just before he died, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said that about people who drove spikes in his hands and feet and shoved a spear in his side. Our Savior is the Savior who forgives. That's how I can say to anyone who've never trusted in Christ, there's nothing on his part holding you back. He's ready to forgive you of whatever. You come to him just as you are and you lay yourself before him and he will forgive you, removing your sins as far as east is from west. Forgiven forever. Thank you, Obadiah, for the reminder of these wonderful truths. And thank you that your words are not limited to the people of Petra who lived among the rocks, but to people who gather right here in these United States. By the way, as the election unfolds this week, in this midterm election time that's upon us, Watch for humility, okay? 
You gotta listen closely because it'll be rare. So watch closely. See if you detect it. See if you hear words that describe or, 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 or reveal a heart that's truly humble. I don't care what side it's on. I don't care which part of the aisle it represents. Look for humility. It's a beautiful thing to behold, and it's rare. Who knows, one day your child may be one of those leaders. And what they've learned at your knee, in your home, they will carry with them when they take office. How beautiful it would be that someone you raised would be leading us as a country. Bow with me, will you? This is a sobering message that you reveal to us, Father, from Obadiah. It makes us quiet. Uh, it, it makes us realize how easy it is to fall into the trap of our own importance or comparison, judgmentalism. How easy to become bound by the cords of our own prejudices and grudges. Broaden our shoulders, Father. Clear our minds of, of those, those serious habits that mark people off and turn them into mental enemies. Give us the feeling that we're superior in some way, as if we are their judges. And remind us that there's hope at the cross. As we humble ourselves and pray, help us as a nation to recover in this long drift away from you. We pray that you will begin that soon by your grace. Thank you for Obadiah and reminding us of these things from his little book with a major message. Through Christ, we thank you. All God's people said, amen.